Today we're going to hear from the Department of Defense's acquisition experts. We want to welcome Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, Dr. Bill LaPlante, and the Service Acquisition Executives, uh, Doug Bush, Nick Gurton, and Andrew Hunter. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, your leadership is vital to getting capability into the hands of our warfighters and to modernize our force, and I want to thank you all for being here. I want to point out that the Space Force brethren are absent today, and it's because we will have a classified hearing to discuss space-related matters uh, in a few weeks. The FY 2025 budget request for the development and procurement of weapon systems is $310.7 billion. While the Fiscal Responsibility Act required you to make some tough decisions on certain programs, this is not an insignificant, insignificant number. So we're having this hearing to better understand how the department leverages those resources to field the programs that we need, preferably on time and on budget. After multiple continuing resolutions, Congress finally enacted the FY24 appropriations bill just last March. However, in many instances, the funds necessary to ex execute acquisition programs are still not in the hands of the program managers. Many factors affecting getting acquisition right but it cannot be denied that repeating continuing resolutions affect the ability of program managers to effectively get the most bang for the taxpayer's buck and field the programs on, uh, on cost and on schedule. That said, over the past five years, Congress has provided the Department of Defense several new acquisition authorities and funding flexibilities, such as rapid prototyping authority and the establishment of software pilot projects. Recent appropriations bills have also supported numerous DOD initiatives to, ra to facilitate rapid innovation outside of a traditional budget cycle. Yet, the reviews are mixed. A recent Navy study showed that most shipbuilding programs are over budget and behind schedule. The Air Force's Sentinel program incurred a non-McCurdy breach and is under review, and the Army recently terminated its fourth, count it, fourth attempt in 20 years to modernize its scout helicopter. We will continue to work with the Department on ways to improve the acquisition process. But I must say we all share responsibility for the state of our acquisition enterprise, and I would tell you that it isn't good, and for a number of reasons. Number one, Congress needs to enact appropriation bills on time. The Department needs to stabilize its program requirements, utilize realistic acquisition strategies, and request the right amount of funding, and sign good contracts. And industry needs to flat out deliver on time. DOD acquisition is not an academic exercise. It's his responsibility for getting the warfighter what it needs, when they need it, uh, so that they can do their job in an increasingly dangerous world. I look forward to hearing from each of you on how we can do better. Um, Senator Murkowski will be joining us shortly. She will have a few statements. Uh, Susan is not here uh, at this moment in time, but she will put her opening, uh, I ask unanimous consent that her opening statement, statement be put into the record. With that, uh, we will start with you, Dr. LaPlante, uh, for your opening statement. I believe, uh, hang on for a second. Yeah, each one of you have three minutes. Uh, know that your full written testimony will be a part of the record. Go ahead, Dr. LaPlante, yeah, you have Thank, the floor. Thanks, uh, Chairman Tester and Ranking Member Collins, who I know will be here, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thanks to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here today with our service acquisition executives representing departments acquisition and sustainment. Uh, as the chairman just said, uh, in recent years, thanks to you all, you've given us more authorities, more ways to do acquisition, increasing flexibility and getting uh, to get things at speed, at capability, and we really appreciate it. We will give you in this hearing, uh, to the extent that you have questions and talk about it, examples of what seems to be working there, where are still the challenges. But an example of what you've given us and how it's being used are the middle-tier acquisition authorities, rapid fielding, rapid prototyping. That is being used right now by my three colleagues down the table, as well as the Space Force in putting together a proliferated LEO constellation. So a lot of goodness happening there. Uh, the Army, of course, has also done things with the software pack pathway as well as others. And Mr. Bush can talk to the Integrated Air and Missile Defense, which uses the software acquisition pathway um, as, as in a hybrid form. Uh, and overall, uh, there's 60 programs that are using software pathway, and that's only been with us a few years. So it shows you uh, what we've been able to do with your help. I think we need to do a lot more, but anyway, it's a positive, uh, positive sign. The other piece is flexible contracting. Uh, as, uh, as the chairman said, contracting is a key part of this. What we've relearned or learned or relearned in Ukraine is the department can do contracting extraordinarily fast when it puts its mind to it. 
We have mes methods like the undefinitized contracting actions, or UCA that can be put in place within days or weeks. And I would say in Ukraine, we've seen that. Uh, there's no reason we can't extend that and continue that across other uh, contracts in the Department of Defense. Uh, another very important uh, tool that you've given us, and industry has paid attention, is multi-year procurements for munitions. Thank you for giving us this, and it shows a degree of trust. Industry has been saying for years, we don't see a demand signal. We need to understand a demand signal. A lot of us have been frustrated by that, saying, what else do you need? We've got the, all, the, all these supplementals coming. Well, I think what the multi-year shows is that we're committed in these cases for those contracts that it won't be a one and done in one year. It's going to be in multiple years and we'll get the savings appropriate with it. And your, your help in getting those multi-years are a big part of it. Um, we've also uh, done things with the service and service specific uh, acquisitions. I would say when, when you're talking about acquisition, there's really, really three legs of the stool. One leg is acquisition, which is the contract. The second is the requirement. This is what the, the chairman was talking about, about getting what the department needs right for the warfighter. And the third is having the money in the right year. Those three legs of that stool, moving across all three in an agile fashion is the, is the secret of really effective acquisition. And so we remind the, the service acquisition executives that, and we uh, work with folks like this committee to make sure we can move across that. Again, um, I, I, I think there's a lot that we can talk about. There's a lot of good that has happened in acquisition, continues to happen. We also have a lot more work to do. So subject to, uh, to the later questions, that's my opening statement. Thank you, Dr. LaPlante. Secretary Bush. Chairman Tester, distinguished members of the Senate Appropriations Committee, Subcommittee on Defense, good morning. Thank you for the invitation to appear before you to share our views on the successes and challenges we face in developing, procuring, and fielding major acquisition programs. The Army's fiscal year 2025 budget represents a sustained commitment to our key modernization portfolios. It also continues modernization and procurement of enduring platforms that will remain us with, with us for some years to come. However, as members of the subcommittee have, I'm sure, noted in reviewing our FY25 budget, the Army's base budget for procurement research accounts are under pressure in an overall flat budget environment. In that context, the Army is committed to getting every bit of modernization we can get out of the funds we receive. The Army cannot do that without your support. And I thank you for your strong support of Army programs in the FY24 appropriations bills and the FY24 supplemental. Passages of those bills were critical in ensuring we stay on track with modernization and replenish our stocks as rapidly as possible. In terms of how programs are doing, I am overall very pleased with where things stand in most Army programs right now. With a few exceptions, Army acquisition programs are delivering on time, on cost, and providing a level of combat effectiveness that is world-class, something one can observe in Ukraine and elsewhere, where our systems are in high demand and performing exceedingly well in high-intensity combat against a very capable enemy. Patriot, Attackums, Javelin, HIMARS, Gimlers, Bradleys, Abrams tanks, and 155 artillery, just to name a few, are showing what U.S. weapons can do on the battlefield. That combat performance is, in my view, the only standard that truly matters. In the end, because whether it's our soldiers using this equipment or an ally, it makes the difference between life and death for the people on the front line. There are, of course, programs where everything is not going perfectly, and I'm happy to dive into the reasons for that with members. But I am pleased to support that with this committee's support, Army acquisition officials are feeling empowered to take informed, thoughtful risk, and when appropriate, where appropriate, to increase our overall pace of development, production, and fielding. From an acquisition policy perspective, as Dr. Plant said, the Army continues to aggressively implement and employ the many reform initiatives provided by Congress. Middle tier acquisition is one. We have 35 programs using it. We've had many success stories. The M10 Booker combat vehicle went from program start to production in four years. Our new 6.8 millimeter rifle went from an idea to production in just three years. And the other very exciting thing is the software pathway Dr. Plant mentioned. This pathway is critical to allow us to go at the same speed industry goes when they're doing their programs. And finally, I should mention that the Army is pursuing multi-year programs. We did four in FY23 for artillery. We're, with this committee's support, we are pursuing two more for PAC-3 and Gimlers in FY24. And uh, a last thing to mention is this committee's strong support for uh, rapid acquisition authority to allow us to respond to urgent threats. We use that authority doing a contract in less than 30 days uh, to meet a critical counter-UAS need in Central Command, which was under attack um, last fall. 
That kind of flexibility when used responsibly with correct oversight is absolutely essential to meeting critical warfighter needs quickly. In closing, I want to say thank you on behalf of the Army for both the funding and authorities we need to support our modernization efforts with continued support from Congress. We are building a force capable of competing across the spectrum of competition and conflict to deter conflict and failing that prevail in conflict. Thank you for your time today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you for your statement. Uh, Secretary Girton, you have the floor. Chairman Tester. And it is good. Yeah. <laughs> Chairman Tester and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear, appear before you today to address our acquisition programs and the defense industrial base. We'd like to thank the subcommittee for your leadership and support to the shipbuilding, naval aviation, and ground programs that maintain maritime superior, superiority in defense of our nation. Maintaining the health of our acquisition programs while strengthening the industrial base is a top priority through strategic partnerships between the Department of Defense, Congress, our sister services, and industry, we are more efficiently and affordably procuring ships, aircraft, and munitions by leveraging the advantages of opportunities such as block buy and multi-year procurement authorities. The FY25 budget requests fully funds the Department of Navy's top defense acquisition priority, the Columbia-class nuclear ballistic missile submarine. Prioritizes resources for the Navy shipbuilding account, to fund investments in the submarine industrial base and includes a San Antonio class landing platform dock in support of the Department of Navy's requirement for 31 amphibious ships. We're also making targeted investments in critical munitions to address today's threats and posture ourselves for tomorrow's challenges. The Department of the Navy continues to invest funds in the weapon industrial base to ensure we can surge and ramp to production in the immediate future. The passage of multiple security supplementals enables us to replenish stocks of U.S. weapons and provide equipment to key allies and partner nations. Supplemental legislation also facilitated and funded our partnerships with industry to expand capacity, modernize existing production lines, and improve resiliency by qualified additional suppliers and streamlining certification capabilities. These investments positively impact our primes, their subcontractors, and critical suppliers across the U.S. while supporting our allies and partners. With deliberate approach, the Department of Navy has increased ship and aviation maintenance and readiness accounts to improve availability while modernizing existing platforms. The Department of Navy continues to make robust strategic investment in our four public shipyards and ensure they're able to execute ship maintenance effectively and efficiently. In align with the, my Secretary's priorities, the Department of the Navy continues to identify and overcome obstacles that threaten the success of our acquisition programs and the industrial base. The launch of the Merit Maine Defense Industrial Alliance in cooperation with federal and local government as well as industry demonstrates our commitment to developing and maintaining a well-trained, skilled, and motivated workforce in support of growing and fostering the shipbuilding industrial base. The Department of the Navy appreciates the continued support and investments from Congress. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you and your subcommittee today. We look forward to answering your questions. Thank you for your statement. Secretary Hunter, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chairman Chester, and, and thank you to the other members uh, for having me here today to provide testimony in the U.S. Air Force Acquisition Programs and also for the support you provide to us in terms of resources uh, and flexible authorities. They are critical to our success in the acquisition enterprise. Uh, we need that flexibility and those resources because the way in which we have to do acquisition in the current security environment uh, is changing and must change. Uh, be less platform-centric and more focused on uh, the integration uh, and the tight integration between systems in order to be effective in the future fight. It requires tight partnerships also between the operational and acquisition communities in the Department of the Air Force and developing the necessary capabilities to deter and win future conflicts. Now, the Secretary of the Air Force has also made clear to the Congress and also to us within the Department of the Air Force that we're out of time. And so we have to re-optimize our organization to move faster and also to prepare for, uh, for a very challenging future fight. And therefore, we're shifting a focus from platforms operating individually to mission threads and capabilities that are required to close those threads reliably and consistently over time in a resilient fashion. This requires us to work across our stovepipes and integrate in ways that are often stymied within our existing organizational structure and that require flexibility within our acquisition approaches uh, in order to execute successfully. So we're adapting our acquisition approaches and our capability development organizational structure to meet the challenges of great power competition. 
Recognizing the challenges laid out in the defense strategy and our operational imperatives in our reorganization, reoptimization initiative, we've gone to implement a next generation uh, acquisition approach that builds upon a foundation of government expertise, technical architectures that enable open systems approaches, and the constant injection of new technologies. It ensures there's continuous competition throughout the life cycle of a program to allow the Air Force to take advantage of new advances in technology through incremental development while lowering the barriers to entry for companies, including non-traditional companies. I want to particularly highlight the Collaborative Combat Aircraft Program as the exemplar of our efforts to develop and field new capabilities, rapidly affordability, and at scale. In fiscal year 25, we'll begin the concept refinement for the next CCA increment as we continue to explore international partnership participation and expand our approach to continuous competition. Since time is of the essence and capability development, we're very thankful to the Congress for providing quick start authority uh, and the NDAA, and I know this committee was very helpful uh, in getting to a successful resolution of that issue. I also want to highlight that we just, uh, just uh, put through that authority and through that process uh, a program to provide C3 battle management for moving target indication at scale, uh, which I think is a very effective use of that authority. We look forward to working with Congress as we organize into a more agile and integrated acquisition system that delivers capabilities quickly and at scale. We welcome the opportunity to provide you more details on our key Department of the Air Force efforts where we can use help, including the establishment of our new software directorate, uh, our implementation of the Defense Acquisition work Workforce Development Account to build that government expertise that I referred to, and our approach to digital material management. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Yeah, I want to thank all four of you for your testimony. We'll get into the questions right now. We have heard a lot in recent years about the challenge that the defense industry has to attract and retain a manufacturing workforce to build weapon systems on time. Uh, this is concerning, and we will be discussing that more today. But my primary question is about the Department of Defense's own workforce. This is for all of you. What is the DOD's acquisition workforce? Uh, our acquisition budgets have grown significantly, but do we have enough qualified and experienced contracting officers? Do we have enough auditors? Do we have enough cost estimators to manage this workload? We'll start with you, Dr. LaPlante. Yeah, thank, thank you. And, and with the authorities that this committee and others have given us, uh, they're, of course, only as good as the workforce to implement them. I would say broadly, like a lot of uh, our economy and our society, there's been a generational change in our workforce. I would, I would say that we have put in place many of the tools that you have given us, including the one that just was mentioned by Honorable Hunter on the acquisition uh, demonstration and the, the funds to train next generation. I would say the area that I'm most focused on uh, really beefing up our contracting officers. A couple of comments on that. Number one, I'm biased, but I actually think that the contracting officers in the Department of Defense are some of the best in the United States government. As a result, they're also highly desirable, both in other parts of the U.S. government, which is not a bad thing necessarily, but out in the private sector. We also, and this is something perhaps that's not fully appreciated, during the years in Iraq and Afghanistan, many contracting officers did service downrange in country four or five times in some cases. Many of those got burned out. So we're rebuilding many parts of the, uh, of the contracting workforce. I would say in pockets, we still have work to do. Net overall, I'm pretty pleased with where we are, but I would also defer to my other colleagues here. And we'll, go to, we'll go to Secretary Bush next from an Army perspective. Where, where, where are we on those three? Senator, I would agree with Dr. LaPlante. If I worry about one workforce, it's the contracting workforce. Okay. Uh, there's only about 9,000 people. Uh, they've doubled their workload, frankly. Uh, they did COVID, then they rolled straight into Ukraine. So is 9,000 optimal, or do you need more? Sir, I, uh, some more would be helpful. However, we are, in the meantime, focused on giving them better technology and tools to be more efficient. So I think a little help in both realms. Efficiency investment and perhaps some more people would be warned. If you could uh, get back to us, don't have to do it now because I want to go to Secretary Girton, get back to us with how many more people you would need, Secretary Girton. Thank you, Senator. Uh, echo of my colleagues that uh, contract officers are a key uh, component of our future. One of the things I've advocated for for years is a better application of modularity and open architectures in order to invoke competition more broadly. and. All of those require contracts. So we need contract officers um, to grow. And honestly, the Navy grows great contract officers because people keep hiring them. So that's uh, something we continually have to refresh. Um, also, a particular note is 
waterfront workforce. We need more people out on the deck plates building and ma maintaining ships. It's a big problem for us. I hope to talk more about that later. Lastly, I'd like to note that <clears throat> we also need to up our game in understanding how to build ships. Naval architects and marine engineers is something that we have a deficit of. It happened over the course of many years, something I'm particularly focused on so we do a better job of understanding our business of building ships. Okay, um, and the, from an auditor's and cost estimator standpoint, we're okay? Um, well, in one of the key areas of, audit, of um, auditing includes keeping an eye on waterfront um, I gotcha. ship production. Okay. That's fine. But in the area of supervisor of shipbuilding, that's an area we particularly need okay. more help with. Secretary Hunter. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Uh, we really value the, the resources that we received in 24 for the DATA account, that workforce development account, 42 million. Areas of need for us include, uh, I would say, software expertise. So while we still rely on industry to produce the vast majority of our software, uh, we need enough government expertise to really be a good customer for that. And we are also increasingly doing uh, organic development of software in our sustainment center, uh, not just for systems that are in sustainment, but also for new development programs like B21 in partnership with our prime. So that is a, that software workforce expertise is a key area of need. And I did want to also mention our acquisition workforce development uh, pilot, which has been a pilot since the mid-1990s. I personally believe it should be permanent, uh, uh, but in a, at a minimum, we need to extend it because that is a key way if we uh, keep our talent. Last follow-up really quick, and you got to answer this very quickly. I got 20 seconds left. Do you guys have a plan? to fix the shortages that you perceive within the contracting? Yes or no? Yes, we are executing okay, that. Doctor, uh, Secretary, Secretary Gurdon. Yes, but we could definitely need some help. Okay, Secretary Bush. Not with the funding I have right now, Senator. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here and uh, your focus on, on what, what we need to be doing better when it comes to accelerating in the acquisition space. Um, I think we recognize that uh, sluggish is, is one of those words that perhaps uh, best describes what happens in a bureaucracy like we are faced. I appreciate your response to, to the chairman about workforce uh, because that is key to, to most everything. But I wanna start, Dr. LaPlante, if you were to give the department uh, a letter grade here on its current efforts to reform and to improve the acquisition process. And I, I noted, uh, Mr. Hunter, that you, you said that you've got an acquisition pilot that has in, been in place for since the 90s. Um, uh, maybe sluggish is, is even too kind of a word. But if you, if, if you have to really critically assess where we are in, in how we're improving the acquisition process, utilizing the new authorities that can help you move faster, what, what, what is that? And, and really what we need to know is what more can Congress do to help move you through uh, to, to some better reforms here? Yeah, I would give it a grade of a B. And the reason I give it a grade of a B on the positive side is the American equipment is the best in the world. The demand for foreign military sales from U.S. equipment is at record highs. Everybody wants the equipment. Everybody sees it work in Ukraine and other places. They know it can also be trained for and sustained. Uh, the demand for our stuff is through the roof. We, don't, we, we are seeing that every day. Where, why is it not higher than a B? Because number one, we still are too slow in certain areas, particularly when it involves with adapting modern software. Number two, we still do not have enough parts and pieces that are interchangeable that we can use and they're not proprietary to one company. Um, the third area which is still frustrating sometimes is we still over, don't get the requirements and the acquisition right and aligned up. So we have, we have a lot more work to do to get faster and to align those. But I would say there's still, when you look at cost schedule performance, as my colleague in the Army said, largely net, Costs, cost increases are coming down, performance is good, and, and schedule is the one area we still need to make improvement on. Let me ask you, um, Secretary Gerton, you, you, you mentioned that uh, uh, within the Navy, you need to focus uh, also on um, how you're building ships, I think is how you, how you framed it. Um, it's my understanding that some of what we're dealing with when, when we're looking at where the Navy is and the shipbuilding demands is, is 
whether it's approving construction when, de when design is not yet complete or perhaps altering existing requirements during the build itself. In other words, you don't have a, you don't have a flow here that, uh, that is consistent. Can you expand on some of the internal lessons learned that the Navy is working to, to rectify as it, as it faces some of these concerns with shipbuilding? Um, I think many of us in this committee, uh, in this Congress, are very concerned about where we are with our, with our naval fleet. Senator, I share your concern. <clears throat> My, um, I was given a charge by the Secretary of the Navy to you know, look at shipbuilding when I was fairly new into the position. And one of the things that came out of it was um, to understand our risk balance. And one of the things we haven't always done well is have a robust, stable design prior to uh, launching into ship construction. Um, one of the things that I intend on doing going forward is to make sure we're taking better advantage of modern development tools that we have for doing uh, upfront modeling and uh, naval acquisition, naval architecture uh, prior to going forward with construction. That's a, a actually a fairly robust set of practices in the commercial industry, but we need to take better advantage of them in how we build our naval ships. Yeah. We Seems need like the right would, kind of people and the right kind yeah. of tools in order to be able to do that. Um, let, me, uh, let me ask uh, back to you, Dr. LaPlante, and this relates to uh, our ground-based missile interceptors. Uh, as you know, in Alaska, we have, uh, we have a, a, a pretty important uh, uh, project up there. Can you give me an update on the next generation interceptor program? Are we on track? Is it delayed? Is it possible that it could even be ahead of time? Where are we? Yeah, the program is on track, the Next okay. Generation Interceptor. Um, as you know, the, uh, we were keeping, and, and the Missile Defense Agency is keeping two contractor teams much later in the process than we typically do, almost up to CDR. They're going through a down select, as we know, in the last couple of months. And I expect that to be, uh, to be on track and on time. Thank Good, you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Shaheen. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to begin a little parochially. Um, Assistant Secretary Hunter, uh, we're very proud that in New Hampshire, the 157th Air Guard flies the KC-46. They were the first unit in the country to get those KC-46s. So I have watched very closely the delays in the rollout of the new remote vision system. I understand it's delayed yet again. So what do we need to do to address that, and how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? Yeah, it's a combination of factors. Uh, Senator, uh, I would say the key thing right now is making sure that we our supply chain is set up, which is why it's related to access to the right microelectronics for that system, uh, and also getting an FAA certification. That's not a particular FAA, it's just the engineering work required to get the FAA certification, so it's having that, that uh, correct next engineering within the industrial base to achieve that necessary standard. Uh, so those are the two main things that are that we need there. I think we are on the path to get, to get in there. And I think we will get our current, uh, that our current timeline for getting the RPS work. So we've got through the hardest part of the design scope is that we're very close to achieving uh, that. So what's the current timeline? Okay, thank you. I, I will hold you to that. Um, Secretary LaPlante, actually this is all of you mentioned the importance of the flexibility reforms, the acquisition reforms that have been done in the last couple of years. And um, one of the, the concerns that I think we all have is how do those um, procurement authorities address the situation in Ukraine and allow us to prepare for future conflicts. Um, so, Secretary LaPlante, do you want to start with that? Yeah, the, well, the authorities that, that have been provided, and we talked already about the software authorities and mid-tier acquisition, have really allowed us to get started very, very fast and to move 
uh, basically in an agile fashion, if you want to use the agile term, and go through sprints. So those were already up and being used across the services when Ukraine happened. What we've added to that with Ukraine was what we learned from COVID and how to do rapid contracting. Uh, a lot of the PPE and a lot of the stuff that was done with, with the vaccines during COVID was done by the Department of Defense. That same rapid contracting was put for Ukraine. So we learned that. I think the other piece that we've learned from Ukraine with these authorities is even if you have these rapid capabilities, you have to do what sometimes one of my colleagues here calls the adult stuff. You have to worry about it's being sustained. You have to worry about being trained to it. And so you can go fast, but you have to go fast with putting these other pieces in line. And that's what we're learning with Ukraine. But I'll turn over to my other colleagues. Mr. Senator, I would echo Dr. Plant's comments. I think uh, the reforms are much appreciated. They do let us start programs faster, uh, which is a good thing. However, the basics still apply. You need good cost estimates. You need realistic requirements. And you need, at some point, to do the whole package, which is something we do better than any other country, which is the logistics, the military construction that goes with a device, like a new range for a new rifle. So, ma'am, I think as long as, uh, you know, getting started fast is good, uh, but it's not the whole story. However, it is a big deal and lets us respond more quickly to new technology and new threats. Um, before, I'm going to follow up on that, so I, I don't need to have um, the other responses. I was just in the Indo-Pacific. One of our stops was in Japan, where, as you know, they have doubled their um, defense operations. And one of the things we heard there was concern about how fast their industrial base could respond to that uh, directive. Have also heard that from our European friends about responding. How are we working with our allies to help them respond? And, and why has Russia been able to rebuild its um, systems in a way that has allowed them to put out um, what appears to be so many more munitions than we've been able to get to Ukraine. I'll try to get to this very quickly and turn over to my colleagues. So on the first, the Russia, we're all monitoring both in open source and other places. What is Russia doing in its industrial base? We saw that Putin just replaced his Minister of Defense with an economist with an emphasis. And I think a lot of us have taken away that this is not, they're not in it for the short term, they're in the long term. The second is the estimates that they're at 7% of their GDP for military. Oh, those are, and they're staying there and they're, going, they're on a wartime footing. Uh, whatever you want to say about the United States, we are not, and I'm not suggesting we should or shouldn't, it's just we're not. Right. The second thing, on your point about allies and partners, across the board, allies and partners are recognizing, both in Europe and in Indo-Pacific, that they need an industrial base, uh, basically restart. Um, for all of the criticism we give ourselves, rightfully so, they're envious of what the United States has been able to do. What we're talking to each of these countries, and I'll talk about Japan and then I'll turn it over as a specific example, is doing co-development, co-production with them to help their industrial base and ours at the same time. The next generation of missile defense interceptor is gonna be called glide phase intercept. It's beyond NGI. That's a collaboration with the Japanese and Japanese companies and American companies. Uh, so that's where this is all headed. You're gonna see much more co-production co-development and co-sustain with allies and partners. Thank you. Senator Moran. Chairman, thank you. One of the things that's uh, taking place that I think has a consequence to the, uh, the industrial base, the defense industrial base, Spirit Aero Systems is a company that employs 12, 13,000 people in Kansas, uh, does a lot of sub work for nearly every prime defense contractor in the country. The indications are that it may be purchased by Boeing. Uh, Boeing, I assume, is interested in its, uh, and, and Spirit does sig significant work for Boeing today on the commercial side, but there's a significant component of Spirit Aerosystems that is defense related. Uh, and I'm interested whether any of you are paying attention to this issue in part to understand what it might mean to our defense uh, industrial base and to supplies. Uh, should this merger occur, um, I'd be interested in, in knowing um, how this may expand or contract our, our, our defense base. 
Uh, Mr. Say Secretary. a few words and then ask my air force. And I should have asked Aunt, Mr. Hunter. Oh, maybe Andrew. You no, I, you're happy to hear from you. Yeah, uh, uh, so, so I'll give the standard caveat right at the beginning. We, I don't, we don't comment on any pending M&A, obviously, because it's a process that go through. I would also say a couple things. Number one is each one has to do be Do you have input in the, We do. In, in the, on, on any of these, on any, on any of these M&As, what happened, whether it's done by the FTC or Department of Justice, the Department of Defense provides input on the, the be, any, any collateral uh, good or collateral bad that would come out of this, and we take each on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I would just say that. But obviously, the health of the U.S. industrial base, particularly companies that do commercial as well as defense in their portfolio, is something of keen interest to us. I'll turn it over to I Andrew. only indicated uh, Mr. Hunter because he just recently returned from visiting. Yeah, Senator, it was, a, it was a great opportunity to visit Spirit and uh, developed a deep appreciation for all the ways in which Spirit is contributing to a, a variety of U.S. Air Force programs, and as you noted, across a number of our, uh, of our key suppliers, our key prime vendors, uh, and uh, in particular, the manufacturing expertise that is resident there and the ability to leverage uh, new production techniques that are very significant and important to our uh, more cutting-edge, newer weapon systems, uh, leveraged out of the commercial uh, development, particularly 787, uh, that is, a, uh, I think, a, a key asset for the nation. And so uh, we'll work closely with Dr. Plan in terms of the department's feedback to ensure that, that those uh, capabilities are a, still able to be utilized in the best way possible. Any either other uh, secretary? So uh, in just uh, camping a little bit on what Dr. Plan said about uh, how the Defense Department looks at this, but we're also looking through the lens of um, is it helping or hurting competition? We want competition in as many places as we can that helps us get a better deal from industry. So that's one of the lenses that we'll look at that through. Um, let me highlight that Spirit Aerosystems, the, this tier one supplier, supports programs like the B-21, the V-280, the CH-53K. It's wide array across all of the department. And uh, in my view, the Defense Department ought to be uh, at least encouraging me and others, if not the, in addition to the administration, to make sure that if there is a merger, that the defense capabilities of spirit is not somehow lost in the process. My assumption is that Boeing is almost exclusively interested in this for commercial manufacturing, and yet if the absence of spirit aerosystems, we lose a lot of defense capabilities I have visited with nearly, well, four or five of the CEOs who, whose companies do work in defense for, with Spirit, and it, there's a general feeling is, I don't know where else we would go in the absence of Spirit doing what it does today. And rest assured, as, as the process, as with others, we will weigh in on the defense implications, both good and, and necessarily not good, on that case. We will absolutely weigh in. Thank you. Senator Reid. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to reemphasize two points the Chairman made. First of all, the responsibility for this predicament, and it is a very serious one, is shared by both Congress and the executive, so we have to work together. Uh, also, the attrition of our government workforce is a key factor, and I don't think we're doing enough to re remedy that. Uh, my impression uh, on, on the decks, if you will, there's a 27-year-old foreman talking to a 27-year-old representative of soup ships, where before the pandemic, there were 50-year-olds talking to each other, which makes a bit of a difference. Uh, but I want to go right to the submarine industrial base. As you know, Congress initiated funding directly to rehabilitate and strengthen the submarine industrial base. Four years later, the Navy took up the cores. Uh, but right now, the Columbia is behind. Uh, and it's slipping further. We cannot produce two attack submarines a year. We're about 1.2. And I think everyone can see this platform is probably the most critical and decisive, both of them, in our inventory. So, Secretary Plant, uh, you sent up a budget this year, the, the President did, which is only buying one Virginia class boat, but also putting significant amount of money into the, the submarine industrial base for parts for additional boats. Can you give us the rationale and logic? Yeah, thank you, Senator. And as you, you well know and appreciate the help of this committee on the summer industrial base, the department had the difficult choice of, of either uh, adding to the backlog 
that was there or take the money and invest it in increased capacity, knowing that that's going to be delayed before we see the increase. And it's the, it's the increased capacity was what the department chose to do. And uh, do you have metrics to measure whether you're doing this efficiently or effectively? Yeah, the, cl the closest metrics that we look at when I know my Navy counterparts, I know probably you do as well and others, is we look at the work, uh, we'll take Columbia for example, we look at the plan of where they are in the work progress compared to the plan, are they maintaining the plan, are they falling behind, are they ahead? And we're tracking it, I mean I know the Navy is tracking it almost every week. We, we watch it at my level every month and for example in Columbia we lost some ground in the fall it looks like we're gaining some of it back right now. The question is, can we gain enough back to get the, the one year, which is the nominal behind on Columbia, to get that shortened? We're watching it very, very carefully. A lot of it has to do, as you know, with the, the technical data packages and work instructions getting to the workforce in a way that they can implement and, and with, with proper learning and, and efficiency. And we're also tracking how Columbia compares, which is 826, to the 827, which is the next submarine, and where that is. And we're seeing the, the learning and the growth there, uh, but we track it all the time. And I'd ask Nick if you want to add anything. Please. So, Senator, as you know, um, we, we are going to be to the point where we need to be able to build two and a third Virginias a year plus serial production on Columbia. Uh, we need to position ourselves for success in that regard. And the investments we're getting from Congress to be able to uh, improve the throughput of the submarine industrial base is critical to be able to get to that point where, um, and it'll be historic, even when we're building Ohio's, we're only building two Los Angeles's a year, and both of those types of submarines are much simpler mm -hmm. than these Virginia's and Columbia's will be. So we absolutely um, support that investment so we could get to the point where we can build two and a third Virginia's a year and serial production of Columbia as, and get to that historic high level of throughput. Do you think you have the capacity to do that? No, sir, we don't. But what? with the investments that we're going to be executing over the course of the next few years, we will get to that point. That would mean investments in additional shipyards or additional capacity shipyards? Um, so uh, the the uh, capacity we're looking at right now is to improve the shipyards we have. In the near term, that's where we need to put our money. Um, I would like to, uh, for, we have actually are, are thinking about and looking at where else we might have shipyard capacity, but right now we're driving more of the work out of the shipyards where they are right at the waterfront and trying to push more of that work into other facilities that can support bringing those submarines together in the couple of places that are unique to that capacity. Thank you very much. And uh, Secretary Hunter, uh, in 2023 in the NDAA, we created a site activation task force uh, resident at Air Force Global Strike to bring operational views into the process of uh, the Sentinel program. Uh, how is that task force working and how are they helping, I hope, with the McCurdy uh, Nunn Bridge? Uh, Senator, they are helping. Uh, I work very closely with General Connor, who leads that task force, uh, meet with him on a very regular basis as we go through the Sentinel Nunn McCurdy process. But of course, we continue to execute that program uh, while we're going through the Nunn McCurdy process. So that's a key partnership. We view B-21 as the best model for integrating our operators and our acquirers, as I referenced in my opening statement. Uh, and that is the model we are looking to execute with Sentinel. Uh, we haven't reached quite that B-21 level of integration yet, but we are well on our way. We have staffed up in the program office with operators from Global Strike, both uh, operators and, and maintainers. Uh, and we are starting to see uh, benef benefits of that, especially as we go through some of the design choices that we have to make uh, to uh, to get to where we want to be with the non McCurdy process. Thank you very much. Senator Bozeman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Plant, we are faced with urgent need to prioritize critical munitions and replenish our stockpile commodities against the backdrop of budget hindered by constraints. This fiscal year, missiles and munitions comprise of 10% of the department's investment funding at $29.8 billion. Dr. Plant, how will current budgetary restrictions coupled with inflation affect your long-term acquisition strategy for munitions? Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, I think what we've all seen in the last couple of years, and actually this is probably the fourth time it's happened since 2000, 
where when a crisis happens, uh, within a year or two, we realize that precision munitions that we, uh, we run low on inventory. And part of this is because we bought munitions historically one year at a time. As I mentioned in my opening, the fact that this committee helped us get multi-years has takes that, it really gives that demand signal back to industry to say, we're not just gonna buy these key munitions one year at a time, we're gonna buy them in multi-years. And you're, you can commit your own capital, your own workforce to this. So what we have for multi-years, thanks to this committee and others, we have multi-year contracts we're putting in place, the Army already for 155, we're gonna put them in for Lorazm, long range anti-ship missile, for JASM, for Patriot MS-E, which is the Advanced Patriot, um, and, uh, and Naval Strike Missile. That's what we're doing to begin to build this back to show the commitment to industry that not just for this year, but you, you perform, you're gonna have this work three, four years from now. So that's, that's what we're doing. But I would say overall, the budget obviously constrains it. Um, we, as I've said, we've always dialed down on manufacturing and production because you can. And so it is one of the bill payers. It's historically been one of the bill payers. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, we've given you this authority. Will you be able to, in the next year or two, then be able to give us uh, good data working with our working with your partners as to the positive effect that this is going to have? Absolutely, absolutely. And I would say we're already seeing some of the positive effect, but we'll do. Good. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, also, I want to highlight the domestic availability of ingredients necessary to manufacture smokeless gunpowder, including nitrocellulose, nitroglycerin, and acid production, a supply chain shortage in these areas could not only impact the ability to manufacture ammunition, but also increase its cost. Uh, Dr. Plant, has the department studied the domestic availability, ab availability of these ammunition components, and is the department concerned with the current, in, current limited availability of nitrocellulose? Uh, what are the limitations for current and future production of nitrocellulose? Thank you. And it has been said many times, that energetics, which some of these are in the category of energetics, actually is the limiting factor for some of these munitions in, in terms of global, actually. So in the cases of almost all the items you mentioned, we are, and, and I can actually ask the Army to, add, to jump in here, finding alternative sources, domestic sources, to really replace these very rare things that many of them were from overseas. But I'd ask uh, Doug if you want to add anything. Senator, uh, on the nitrocellulose front specifically, uh, we have this year coming online at uh, Radford Army Ammunition Plant a $700 million previous investment made years ago uh, by Congress to go to a fully modern, very high capacity production capacity that's on our ammo plant. So, sir, I think that one we are going to end up ahead of the problem, not behind, uh, which is great to see. However, we do have other sources. We have focused on making sure those are friendly countries. Of course, we, we want allies providing these things, not our potential enemies. Right. We have other tasks, sir, directed by Congress to, by 2028, not have any, uh, I would say, unfriendly sources in our ammunition chemical supply chain, I would call it. And we're committed to achieving that, sir. And it's going to require uh, some investments here, but also working with members on uh, working through how we can do that with allies as well. Good. So that's the one we're hearing the most about, the nitrocellulose. Uh, anything we can do to support your efforts, uh, uh, you know, just let us know. The National Defense Industrial Strategy prioritizes the need for skilled and staffed workforce. Camden, Arkansas has become a leader in the defense industry at a time when our country needs it the most. We recognize there's more work to be done to recruit, retain, and provide skilled workers with the best opportunities as we ramp, ramp up production and capacity. Uh, Dr. Plant, what is the extent, what, to what extent is the department working with industry partners to invest and renew interest in industrial jobs to optimize workforce readiness? Uh, thank you, Senator. Almost every meeting that we have with industry that I have or my colleagues have, most of the meeting is talking about workforce. And each company is in sort of a different place, which would expect. But writ large, for example, welders across the country in any industry are, uh, they're, they're very, very prized right now. The other piece that we're seeing is the price differential between what the defense industrial base will pay for, let's say, some type of workman, HVAC or whatever, the delta between that and the services industry has, has, has decreased. So we have to work with the companies without you know, with doing it cost effective and how we can get some of the wages higher. The other piece of this that we're finding is really important is supervisors. 
We had a whole generation of supervisors basically retire during COVID. Um, what really matters to most workers is your direct supervisor. So a lot of emphasis there. But this is a huge, it is the number one issue of our industrial basis workforce. Right, very good. Um, thank you all so much for all you do. We really do appreciate you. Mr. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Girton, uh, during a recent Senate Armed Services Committee hearing, Senator Peters asked uh, you about the frigate program. Um, I uh, was, I take issue with your answer, and I want to, um, uh, you seem to minimize the Navy's shared responsibility for challenges facing that program. In my view, it's not merely that the Navy failed to perform sufficient oversight, as you mentioned in your response, but that the Navy has directly contributed to the delay by requesting substantial design changes, as well as a slow, uh, slowly approving um, design deliverables. By some reports, the frigate was intended to maintain 85% of a prior design, um, but now in part due to the Navy's request for changes, retains only 15% of that uh, previous design. And while some changes related to enhanced survivability are to be expected, these drastic numbers tell me that the Navy is contributing to program delays. So Mr. Secretary, yes or no, do you agree that the Navy shares responsibility for the ship design issues that have caused delays for the frigate? Senator, yes I do. I'm sorry that um, I, I left that impression. Uh, this was absolutely a, a government industry partnership and um, the extent that, I mean, we didn't change the requirements for survivability after the contract was let, but I think, I don't think we understood the full impact of what that was going to be when the ship designers and naval architects got to work and figured out, well, what did that requirement mean in terms of the impact to the base design? Thank you for that response. The, the Navy has identified growing and maintaining a skilled workforce as a primary challenge for the frigate program. For the last two years, I secured increases to the Navy's budget specifically to expand the frigate workforce and industrial base. And I'm working again this year to increase workforce funding because the need certainly remains. Mr. Secretary, how will this for workforce investment address factors contributing to the frigate delay. Well, I'm, thank you, Senator, for uh, helping us with getting a workforce, especially in uh, the places where we're necessary for building this frigate. Um, it's been uh, especially helpful uh, to uh, make sure that we have the right people out in those build buildings. I had a chance to visit up there in Marinette a couple of times, and it is a fantastic facility. We just don't have enough people out there building those ships, and that will be a big help to attract people into that environment. But we also need to work with uh, Fink and Terry specifically to make it an attractive place to work in terms of the equities for working in that environment. Yeah child care and other kinds of aspects of the community nearby. And we can do that in partnership with the industry and with your support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hoven. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary LaPlante, one of the most important things we're doing is uh, updating the nuclear triad. Uh, incredibly important. And uh, we're now doing a non uh, McCurdy review on the Sentinel portion um, are you committed to making sure that we work through that, that we stay on track, and that we do the full uh, Sentinel modernization on schedule? Yeah, thank you for the question. Just to state um, the important thing right at the very beginning, as you said, Senator. Number one, the modernization of our triad is the top priority um, of the Defense Department. The triad, of course, is the, the next generation bomber, B-21, the next generation SSBN Columbia, we just spoke to, and of course, Sentinel, the, which replaces Minuteman III. Um, the, the, in 2022, the Nuclear Posture Review by this administration reaffirmed the need for a triad. So none McCurdy or not, we have a policy of our country of having and sustaining a triad. In the case of the Nun McCurdy, I'm committed to working with the Air Force and with the cross DOD team to go through the letter of the law and make sure that we, uh, if we do recertify, and it's not a guarantee, that we recertify a program that is executable and will meet replacing uh, that leg of the triad. Uh, we're about a month and a half 
from the end of that process. We have a lot of work going on, um, and uh, I will just continue to keep this uh, committee informed. But separate from the non McCurdy, we need to try it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Secretary. And then I, I know the chairman of, of this committee uh, shares uh, my sentiments on this, but is there anything that, that we can do that is helpful to you in this process? I think already there's been a, a tremendous help, particularly, of course, by, by the chairman here. Um, he, I think a lot of the focus, as assuming if we go forward, is going to be really on the localities, on getting for the states impacted, of course, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Nebraska, that, North Dakota, that we are reaching out as soon as possible to make sure the communities are ready for what's coming, to make sure we're listening to the communities, and as I've spoken with the chairman here, to make sure that uh, things like the vocations needed, um, that we're as, as early as possible get that in the communities. And of course, you all know your communities better than anybody, and so any of your help will be appreciated, including letting us know when we're, when we're not making the mark. Okay. Uh, thank you, Secretary. Next question relates to countering drones. You're, we're seeing, obviously, in Ukraine, Israel, across the world, uh, the threat that is pr proposed by drones. And in some cases, we're using million-dollar missiles to shoot down a very inexpensive drone, and you've got swarms. What are we doing on uh, countering drones to get ahead of the curve here? That is the problem of our time, so we're doing a lot. Number one is that um, I chair, that started just in March, and in a senior integration group that moves equipment, counter drone equipment, into theater ASAP. At the same time, the Army is the lead service on building out towards an integrated capabilities. We now have a between 40 and 50 different counter drone cap, uh, technologies. We're finding out which ones work and which ones get, need to get fielded. To your point, um, we also have to make the exchange ratio be cost effective. If we're shooting down a $50,000 uh, one-way drone with a $3 million missile, that's not a good cost equation. We're working through it. Many of the solutions we're looking towards with industry and with non-traditionals are very cost effective. That is our, our high priority. But I will say the technology is changing every couple of weeks and the tactics are changing. And it's going to be just a constant, uh, a constant fight. But we're all over it. At Grand Forks, we do an uh, incredible amount of work with uh, drones, not only in terms of the, mission, the base's mission there, but we have a test site for UA, uh, UAS there. We're also, uh, we've got uh, Customs and Border Protection co-located on the base. We have responsibility for 900 miles of border, actually all the way out to uh, contiguous with the chairman. Um, that would be a very good location for you to do some of this work. Are you aware of what's going on there? And, and uh, what about looking at it for some of this work? De the details that you just went through, I'm not aware of, but I'd love to follow up on it. And to the point, it, the, the talent and the expertise <coughs> in building drones oftentimes is exactly the same expertise in countering them because you understand right. actually what the technology is, what they're dependent upon. So yes, I'd be happy to follow. Yeah, I'd like to get you out there. And also, Secretary Hunter, same for you. And I would like to add the ISR component. We need more ISR. What are we doing to make sure we lead the world in that ISR capability? Well, thank you, Senator. We are, uh, we are working hard on that. Obviously, there's elements of that we can't talk about uh, in this forum. but. Uh, uh, but that is a huge priority for the Air Force. And so we will continue to dialogue with you on the investments that we're making there uh, to advance those capabilities. I agree with you. They are essential, particularly to, uh, to our kill chains. And I'd like to get you out to, uh, to North Dakota, to Grand Forks area, uh, along with Secretary LaPlante. I, I think it would be helpful for both of you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for being here today. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Coons. Thank you very much, Chairman Tester. And um, thank you to all of you. Um, I agree with you that we have... Um, widespread, I think, bipartisan grave concern about whether our defense system overall uh, is appropriately aligned uh, with the requirements of the warfighter, um, that we are taking advantage of innovation in the American system as we are producing and delivering um, weapons and weapon systems and platforms that are more and more dependent on software, on IT, on interoperability and communications. Um, I'm concerned we're not learning the lessons of the war in Ukraine. Um, the MacGyvering of solutions in the midst of an otherwise very difficult and complex battle space. So let me just briefly ask a few questions, if I might, as the newest member of the committee. Um, you recognize, uh, if I might, um, that there's a huge acquisition workforce, I think 187,000 acquisitions professionals, um, and that just having the workforce to do the acquisition is important. 
what work is being done, if I might, um, Under Secretary LaPlante, to make sure that the acquisition workforce is familiar with, comfortable with, and able to use authorities like other transactions authority, CSO, to take advantage of the MTA pathway? What's being done to make sure that more broadly the acquisitions community that may have never seen or done one of these transactions is able to? Yeah, we have a whole uh, education and training effort led out of Defense Acquisition University. I was just there actually two days ago speaking to one of their graduating classes that it's all about having experts come in with case studies and say, this is how you use a software acquisition pathway. This is what you need to know about modern software and teaching, teaching, teaching. The best thing that can be done is experts that have done it in one part of the DOD teaching experts in another part. And that's what we're doing. We're spreading the word. It's a lot more of it is online and a lot more of it is also we're, we're bringing in industry. In fact, the class that I spoke to the other day had uh, a quarter of it were from industry. So I think all of the above is what we're doing, knowing that you can be an expert in software acquisition today. Two years from now, you may not be an expert anymore. You have to keep up with it. Um, I, I was struck in your testimony, um, and maybe I just misread these numbers quickly, um, of 236 programs that use the MTA pathway, Three have transitioned to full operational capability and 107 to other pathways. Help me understand that ratio. Did I misunderstand what the other pathways meant? Yeah, let me tell you what I, I believe without having the numbers right in front of me. So, so the, the mid-tier acquisition was put in place, I believe, in 2018, and there was a restriction on it that said, or basically said with waivers, it's got to be out of it by five years. Right. So by definition, five years later, you're not gonna be an MTA anymore for most of these that right. were started then. So the question is when you're nearing the end of that MTA, which is rapid fielding or rapid prototyping, what do you do? Do you transition it into mid major capability, which means, for example, now go into higher rates of production, or do you do some other version of it? And I think that's what you're seeing. We do have examples of where they've reached the warfighter. Last question, if I might. Um, a big piece of the NDIS um, partnering and our allies. AUKUS Pillar 2 is particularly intriguing to me. What do you see as priorities for co-development with close allies, and this may also be particularly relevant to the Navy, um, of capabilities that may be both in terms of workforce and in platforms we can't do on our own? So Senator, you mentioned earlier the lessons of Ukraine. One of the lessons of Ukraine is co-production of munitions. So right now we're working a lot across Europe around co-production of 155, co-production of Patriot in Australia, separate from AUKUS, we're gonna be doing co-production, the Army is, of Gimblers and eventually Prism. And I mentioned earlier about Japan with the Glide. I think you're gonna see much more co-production and co-sustainment with our allies and partners. Thank you for your testimony. I look forward to staying in touch, and I will echo what you heard from several other senators about the urgency of deploying the counter UAS platforms at speed that are effective and affordable. Thank you, Senator Coons. Um, we're gonna do another round, uh, and I've got a short question that I'm going to ask. Uh, it goes to the previous question that I started out with, and it goes actually to your answer, Secretary Bush. You said you didn't have the money at this time, so I want to kind of flesh that out a little bit. Uh, Congress established a, a distinct appropriations account to ensure sufficient funding to recruit and retain acquisition personnel. Have you used that account? Do you have access to that account? Is it effective? So, Senator, the, the uh, DOTF account, yes, we, of course, use it to, to train folks. And uh, it's, if it was bigger, that would actually be very helpful. And it wouldn't have to be dramatically bigger. A little bit could go a long way uh, across the services. Okay. Uh, as far as the Navy and the Air Force goes, do you guys use that account? And do you feel the same way the Secretary of the Army, or the Secretary Bush feels? Yes, Senator, we do. And it's, uh, it's been very effective, uh, much like what the Army has experienced. Is it adequate? Um, I'll have to get back to you on that. I, I don't have a number in front of me right now, but I'd, I'd say we could probably use more. But, okay, keep going. Secretary Hunter. Senator, uh, we, we do use it. Uh, as I mentioned, $42 million in, in the 24 budget. Uh, our request for 25 is $52 million within that account, so it is an increase, and it reflects the fact that we are ramping up both development and production across a number of acquisition programs. So we do need more resources and have requested them. Did you have any questions? Uh, Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Hunter, in the, in the FY25 budget, uh, Air Force is acquiring less fighters than originally projected, uh, six less 
F-35s, six less F-15E uh, Xs than originally planned. Um, we all get that it's right to get the right technology, um, but at some point, it, it doesn't really matter how capable the fighter is, you've got to have, you have, to have sufficient numbers. Um, in Alaska right now, the 18th Fighter Intercept Squadron, um, we think is accepting some increased risks because of the low inventory of the F-16s in the unit. So question to you is, as our, our threats and missions increase, our aircraft inventory continues to decrease, does Air Force have a plan to increase the size of its fighter fleet in the out years? So we, we are continuing with purchase of our fifth gen uh, fighter aircraft, uh, F-35 and, and F-15EX uh, in the 25 request. Um, the, uh, we also intend to, uh, in effect, multiply, force multiply that fighter force with the collaborative combat aircraft. Uh, and that's trying to, again, change that cost equation that Dr. LaPlante referenced that in terms of munitions. It's also very true in the uh, tactical aircraft space that at some point, uh, we need a mix of affordable aircraft along with our higher end uh, fighter aircraft. And so we see the collaborative combat aircraft as being that affordable uh, element that allows us to force multiply our fighter fleet, which the crewed fighter fleet, which remains essential, uh, but is, is always something where it's gonna be challenging to get up to you know, the hundreds of aircraft production numbers that would be necessary to stay completely even on the size of our fighter force. So let me ask a question about um the, the expansion of, of research and the modernization funding in OSD rather than in the military services. Uh, in this fiscal year, that includes one billion in DIU and more than 500 million for the replicator initiatives to field thousands of autonomous attributable systems in the next 18 months. Um, one of the things that, that has been underscored in this committee is that OSD-led efforts have a clear path to be fielded at scale, which is really the responsibility of the military services. Drones or other innovative capabilities just can't be bought. They need to be incorporated into the tactics and the procedures for how the military services prepare and fight war as well as, as being maintained and modernized. So for each of you here, there is, do we have sufficient rigor to ensure these sorts of efforts at the OSD level, that there's this there's ro robust, clear transition plans that include how the services are going to employ, field, and, and maintain these systems at scale. Um, to start by, I'll start by saying, first, by asking the question, Senator, you're actually making a really, really important point. The services lead on fielding at scale and organized training and equip, not OSD. Right. Not OSD. And so what's really, really important is much beyond the technology and the widget is what we call dot mil PF, the doctrine, the training, the operations. So if otherwise, it just doesn't really matter, and we're seeing that with Ukraine. So what's really important of these prototypes and efforts, whether they're done by OSD, DARPA, or done by you know IRAD, is that there be, if it's successful, a credible way to get this at scale and that the services can use it, can train to it, and can sustain it. Uh, so it's a key point for us to watch rather than just get excited about the prototype by itself. So it you think it's a good idea, but we're not quite there yet in terms of making sure that we are implementing to scale? I, I would say it's a good idea, but the, if, if it's like saying if you're three innings into a baseball game and the pitching's going really well, don't celebrate. Because you have to finish the job, and finish the job is the stuff has to get to the services. Secretary Bush? Senator, I would suggest members think of it in two ways. One is OSD does have a, a times useful independent role in experimentation and prototyping with technologies that we haven't been able to focus on. And there needs to be a space for that. There needs to be funding for that because sometimes they do discover things that we won't on our own. However, when it comes to scale, ma'am, the most productive uh, efforts are ones that are paired with the services, meaning they are collaborative and cooperative with a clear path to us from their work. We have had some successes. The Army's new mid-range capability, which is our land-based anti-ship uh, batteries, started uh, with the SCO project. And we took it, created and made it an Army program. We took their work, built on it, and are now, we have fielded that. So there, there can be successes, man. We're doing that with Replicator, with the Army's effort that's been announced. 
I think that tight coupling is where, when the dollars get big, there needs to be a service partner identified in advance before the money gets too big, would be my, my way to think about oversight. Appreciate that. Secretary Gertin, anything final to add? Uh, so the Navy has been very supportive of Replicator. Uh, we actually brought uh, uh, two Navy and one Marine Corps projects to the first tranche of Replicator in, in partnership with OSD. And I echo uh, uh, Mr. Bush's comments that uh, that partnership is critical to fielding at scale. One um, other aspect to that is um, when we're looking at uh, these kinds of initiatives, we want to make sure we carry forward the sustainability and support work to make sure that our soldiers, uh, sailors, airmen, marines, guardians can actually use this stuff in a reliable way when they need to in, in a fight. And uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you all. Thank you all for your service. Um, I wanted to turn to uh, a very expensive program. Uh, with a set of serious safety concerns attached to it. That's the Tilt Rotor V-22 Osprey program. Um, at the end of November 2023, we saw yet another fatal Osprey crash that came to the lives of eight airmen due to a parts failure from March 2022 to November 2023. We had 20 service members die in four fatal crashes. Um, in February of 2023, DOD indicated that it had solved the hard clutch engagement problem thought to be behind these accidents um, with 99% certainty. The department made that assurance only for two more Ospreys to go down in Australia in August and then in Japan in November of 2023, the accident I referenced. Um, this is an important program, it's an expensive program, but it's a program that seems to be plagued by significant and deadly safety concerns. So uh, Assistant Secretary Hunter and Assistant Secretary Gurdon, let me ask you this. Um, I know you take these losses tremendously seriously. Um, can you update the committee on how your services are working to address these unanswered and ongoing safety problems with the V-22 Osprey? Senator, you're right, this is a particularly grave concern. The, uh, uh, Navy and Air Force took it very seriously. Um, we did a, a grounding of those aircraft after uh, the November crash, and we rigorously investigated. We looked at what the, we actually brought that craft back up out of the water. We investigated what was going on, did detailed analysis, and we better understand what happened in that particular failure mode. Um, we have established a, a crawl, walk, run approach to get back to the point where we can get back to the uh, flight envelope. Well, not there yet. We have. Um, so the uh, um, getting back to the crawl, walk, run. We've um, we're now in a um, limited envelope, uh, but we're. Um, characterizing and collecting data so that we can better understand where we are and be able to safely get back to the full flight envelope of that aircraft. The Marines have been flying that thing for years. They have a lot of them. They love that aircraft, but we have to make sure that it's safe for them to fly. And uh, Senator, I appreciate the question. We obviously very deeply uh, regret the, the loss of life. It was a terrible tragedy. Uh, we have been working very closely with the Navy on this, sharing our engineering expertise. The Navy is the lead, uh, has the lead engineering role and function for this platform, but it's an important platform for the Air Force as well. Uh, and as uh, Secretary Girton indicated with the crawl, walk, run approach, we have, uh, we have definitely uh, taken great care. Uh, and I know uh, AFSOC has taken great care to ensure that as we return, as we get on the path to return to flight operations, uh, every step of an echelon of the operating uh, units uh, and the support functions that support them are, are ready to go to the next stage to resume flight operations. Um, 20 service members lost in the last two years, 60 service members lost overall to the Osprey. Um, look forward to continuing uh, this dialogue. Um, to Secretary LaPlante and Secretary Bush, um, I will note that the Army decided in 2022 to move forward with a tilt rotor aircraft. Uh, for the future long-range assault aircraft, despite these safety concerns, and despite the tilt rotor bid being close to twice the cost of the competing bid. 
And so this committee is left with a contract award for a major program for the Army that has potential major cost implications and has serious safety concerns. So let me ask you, um, can you talk about the steps that are being taken by the Department and the Army with respect to the FLARA contract that is underway to ensure that this new tilt rotor, the Valor, does not expose soldiers to the same risks that are apparent with the tilt rotor Osprey? I'll just say a few words and then turn it over to my colleague, Doug. Obviously, the, the safety considerations and the, and the hard uh, facts of what you've been saying about the, this terrible losses in the last year, year and a half, weigh heavily on us. And I know the Army is, uh, it, it's, it's all part of how they're considering going forward these programs. I'll let Doug continue. Senator, thank you for the question. I believe the Army, uh, we believe we will benefit from the 20 years of engineering experience and knowledge uh, that the Osprey um, uh, has, uh, will provide to um, our design, which we believe will be fundamentally different in certain respects um, to make it a, uh, as reliable and safe an aircraft as possible. Sir, I would, military aircraft do tragically crash sometimes. It is, military service is inherently dangerous but we are committed to, of course, the safest aircraft we could possibly get. And we were happy to, we will work with members on that as we move forward. Well, I appreciate your answers, but I think anybody who has followed the history of military aviation would submit there have been particularly difficult problems with the tilt rotor, in part because of the complexity of its design. And I certainly worry um, that we have not to any degree of satisfaction to these families, um, settle the safety concerns on the Osprey. And to your point, uh, Secretary Bush, we are developing a new version of the tilt rotor, and so some of the lessons learned will be applicable. But there's also just as good a chance that there are going to be a whole new set of safety concerns with the Valor that are going to add to the expense of this program that are ultimately going to be significant safety liabilities for our servicemen and cost liabilities for this committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Moran. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions uh, in what time I have. Uh, talk a bit about ammunition. Uh, uh, Secretary Bush, you and I had a conversation, I think in a classified setting, about uh, ammunition. Uh, we have an old Army ammunition plant in Kansas that the Army has invested significant dollars to bring it back into production. And uh, I think as a result of the passage of the supplemental, uh, that plant is now prepared to manufacture 12,000 um, 155 millimeter ammunition uh, as requested. Uh, so thank you for that investment. Uh, my, my question is, are we going to avoid the the ups and downs and the, based upon the demand of the moment for ammunition. Is there any demand signal to this plant or any other in the country? What happens when Ukraine is behind us? Uh, is, the, is there a plan that, that precludes going through what we just went through with this significant investment uh, that doesn't require that again in the future? Senator, yes, if I could first say uh, uh, thank you for the support and for the uh, great folks in Kansas who are helping us build that load assemble pack facility. It comes online this summer as part of our overall ramp up uh, to our desired level. Uh, to, your, to your main question, um, we are thinking very carefully about that. What we don't want to happen is a cliff where we have a rapid loss of workforce and a uh, uh, unwise uh, ramp down that uh, puts at risk these investments we're making in brand new facilities. So, Senator, my ideal situation would be, oh, you know, over time, uh, when we uh, are required to ramp down to lower production levels, we do two things. One, we maintain these facilities, either ideally with work, foreign military sales, for example, if we can keep that going, that lets us keep the high production rates going even longer. And, but even if that winds down, that we work share among the different facilities to maintain them in at least a warm status with enough people to be able to ramp up quickly. Uh, one thing I will admit uh, was not in place before uh, was a, a really a kind of a, a war plan to ramp up production. Just like we have war plans for going in fighting wars, I believe we need one for mobilization. And one that we should rehearse and think about and uh, try out every now and then, even if it's simulated. So this, 
that, sir, needs to be a key part, lesson learned from this whole thing for the department, not just the Army, so that our potential enemies know that we can ramp up quickly, and that should deter them from taking us on. But we have to do it, sir, and not just talk about it. Yeah. I'll just add to what Doug said. Um, what we're putting in place with the methodology that um, Honorable um, Chris Lohman, who works for me, is doing with the services is not just have the requirement for the level of the munition, but to say, what is the requirement after the conflict is over to replenish or reconstitute the munition? How fast and, how, and, and, and to what extent? And put that in the requirements, and then we all have to budget to it. So we have to stick with it, I think, because both the multi-years that we mentioned that you gave us and this concept that Doug's describing, we have to do it because we always get surprised. Uh, thank you both for your answers. My final question, Mr. Chairman, um, technology coordination between defense and commercial sectors seems important to me, uh, and a bit for what I talked about earlier in my questioning, uh, to facilitate the speed and development of JADC2, in this case, capabilities. Uh, Dr. LaPlante, would you speak to the need for clarity and assigned responsibilities for JADC2 within the DOD? Yeah, thank you. The, the DOD uh, is building out what's the JADC2, which in layman's terms is a way of doing the kill chain, if you will, command and control of the kill chain across multiple weapons, multiple sensors, and multiple platforms. Doing that together with kinetic and non-kinetic is what JADC2 is all about, and it's what the department is building out. The services are working diligently on their piece. What OSD is doing is making sure that the standards are correct between the difference so we have interoperability, that we don't have vendor lock, and then to your point about commercial, that we take advantage of the best of commercial technology and make sure it's in there, whether it's rapid networking reconstitution, whether it's artificial intelligence. That is what's being built with JADC2. The services are doing their piece. OSD is making sure that they can talk to each other as we build it together. Would non-DOD experts in the development of this capability, this capacity, be beneficial? Absolutely, because if you think about what uh, a 5G has had to do, which is build a, a terrestrial network that has high data rate, low latency, that is essentially what we need in, in JADC2, with the caveat that we're fighting these things in very contested areas. Thank you. I want to thank you for your testimony. I want to thank each and every one of you for the work that you do. Uh, we've got challenges out there in, in, uh, in this acquisition sphere, whether it's competition, whether it's workforce, whether it's timeliness, whether it's meeting costs. Whether it's the continuing CR baloney, and I'm being generous when I say baloney that comes out of Congress, whether it's government shutdowns, whether it's budget adequacy, we gotta work together. We gotta be honest with one another. Uh, this is important stuff, especially at this moment in time. Uh, senders will have, uh, may they may submit additional written questions. We would ask that you would respond to those questions if they come in in a reasonable amount of time. The, this, this, this defense subcommittee will reconvene on Tuesday, May 21 at 10 a.m. for a hearing with the Department of Army. We stand in recess.